Cool. Sounds good. Uh, thanks everyone for hopping in. Um, Kevin will be here in three seconds. Um, but yeah, we appreciate everyone being here um, for, uh, for our event. On behalf of Arster, I'd like to welcome everyone. I think we're going to have fun tonight uh, chatting about uh, drinks policy um, and uh, about a uh, book I wrote on it. And uh, I think hopefully will be one of the uh, one of the times when we can actually uh, have fun talking about policy in the uh, current political environment uh, leading up to to November, um, there's uh, there's a lot going on. So I think it's uh, it's nice to talk uh, a fun version of politics and policy, and I think the alcohol space is uh, is definitely that. Um, so uh, welcome again. I appreciate you all being here. Um, this is. Uh, definitely meant to be a, a virtual uh, a happy hour event um, and emphasis on happy hour. So I would definitely encourage everyone to uh, pour themselves a, a drink, um, whatever their beverage of choice might be, whether it's a beer or cocktail, uh, feel free to, to go for it. Uh, now I will be partaking myself afterwards and make sure I get through this safely, but I've actually uh, already got lined up uh, uh, Virginia Distillery's uh, Courage and Conviction American Single Malt which was released uh, earlier this year in the middle of the pandemic. It's actually a really delightful American single malt, um, which, is, which is a fun category since you don't see that all the time from American distillers. It's actually their second uh, batch of it. So uh, that's what I will be drinking and I encourage everyone else to, to grab a drink mm -hmm. as well. Um, and as noted on the invite, I just wanna make one note up front. Um, the people that are attending, uh, we will uh, do our best to get book copies out too um, as, as part of this. We would have obviously just handed them to you if we were able to do any of this in person, uh, but it's a bit different now. So uh, the, my publisher will uh, work with me to, to ship them your way. Um, and uh, I think we'll have enough for, for everyone, hopefully. So um, we're, we're excited about that. Um, and uh, lastly, I will, I'll get the ball rolling here by introducing uh, Kevin. Uh, Kosar. Uh, he is a, uh, a scholar, resident scholar at the American Enterprise Institute. I'm really excited to be chatting with him about this tonight uh, because he is the perfect person. He himself is a longtime drinks writer and uh, drinks scholar uh, in the alcohol policy space. He's written two books himself on uh, spirits, one uh, Whiskey of Global History and the other Moonshine of Global History, which are, are worth uh, checking out if you're at all interested in this stuff. Uh, he also, uh, back in the day, I think it was the first uh, drinks review site online, actually, alcoholreviews.com, uh, back in the day, Kevin uh, started and uh, continues to, to post and uh, rate and, and talk about uh, different uh, uh, booze products on that. So it's definitely worth checking out as well. He also has the distinction of being the person that founded uh, Our Street's alcohol policy program. Uh, back when he was at R Street, um, he put booze policy kind of on the map for free market think tanks and was gracious enough to hand it over to me. So uh, he's he's definitely the person to uh, talk with tonight about this. Um, and and uh, we already were kind of conversing a little bit about some of the things we talk about. So I'm, I'm pretty excited about it. But uh, Kevin, I don't know if you have any words that you want to get in, but uh, it's, it's, it's all yours. All righty. Well, thank you, Jared, for having me uh, join you on this special occasion. And thanks to the audience out there. Uh, and I hope everyone has uh, poured himself or herself something special, something fitting for this grand occasion. I actually have here a um, George Dickel 17-year-old reserve Tennessee whiskey. And this is a whiskey I have saved for probably about four years. Um, comes in this little half bottle. It's really hard to get. But I decided to crack it tonight uh, for Jared's book party. Um, give me liberty and give me a drink. It's a, it's a really handsome book. If you haven't seen it yet, I mean, just take a look at this thing. It's really well done. It's a piece of art. Um, and the fact that you've got uh, endorsements on the back of the book from two of the top drinks writers in America, Clay Risen and Lou Bryson, attests that it's not just a pretty book, it's a high quality book. So congrats on that, Jared. Thank you. Now you and I are going to chat about your book and booze for about 20 minutes and then we'll have the audience ask you questions. Um, so if you're out there in the audience, you know, do like Jared said, start putting your questions in as you see fit. Um, and we'll get to them. Um, but before we get to our q and I just wanted to take a moment to, uh, to toast you, Jared. Uh, in 2016, you showed up in my office, uh, my dingy office at Farragut Square, a building that no longer exists. 
Um, and you had previously reached out to me about freelancing for R Street. Uh, put it mildly, I was surprised. You were an attorney working for a fine DC firm. You had practiced appellate advocacy. You had co-authored Supreme Court amicus briefs. You'd clerked for a federal judge. And, and here you are, you coming to me to ask if you could write about booze. Uh, suffice to say, it was a really easy answer for me. And your very first piece was published in June 2016, and it's still on our street's site. Uh, it was titled, Virginia's infamous food beverage ratio prioritizes cronyism over consumers. And I mentioned that piece not only because it was your first one, but it was the seed from which all that has followed has grown. Um, you know, you've created a drinks policy site, drinksreform.org. You created and led the, and lead the commercial freedom department at R Street. You've dropped, I don't know how many research papers and commentary pieces out there, and now you got this book. Um, it's a remarkable achievement uh, in a very modest amount of time. Uh, and so for that, I just wanted to uh, you know, lift a glass to you, and I hope others will lift a glass to you and uh, celebrate you for all you have achieved uh, and to say, keep at it. Yeah, no, I appreciate it, Kevin. Yeah, it's, uh, as I said, it wouldn't have happened without, without you getting it rolling at our street with, with the, the booze policy. And it's, it's a fun topic. I mean, that's why I wanted to ultimately get out of the law firm chair and into think tank chair because you can do things like write about alcohol policy and it's a lot of fun. Yep, and R Street's uh, uh, the kind of place where you can have that creativity and do that sort of offbeat stuff. There aren't too many think tanks that have uh, drinks policy programs. That's 100% true, yeah. We, we find the, the, the weird topics and dive into them with two feet. So we've done that with, with booze policy for sure. Well, all righty, let us get to the Q&A. Um, I have about 10 questions, They're pretty straightforward. And let me hit you with the first one. So you've written a book about drinks policies, really bad drinks policies. Why? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and, and, and the reason behind it is, is simple. I, when I started writing about it uh, with that article that you mentioned, but then in the years since then, uh, I, I ran across a lot of people that actually worked in the industry, uh, people that distilled uh, whiskey, people that made beer, uh, people that owned bars. Um, and I just started talking to them, um, at A, to kind of get their stories of what they were dealing with, but B, just to learn uh, more about what their day-to-day -day was like. And the, the take-home message I got from all that was that, man, they, uh, they were dealing with a lot. There was a lot of uh, kind of arcane, uh, antiquated laws that they were dealing with um, that would just totally be head scratching and just uh, uh, totally blow people's mind in other sectors that were just kind of par for the course in alcohol. And the more that I talked to them, the more I realized that this was, you know, I, I, being in Virginia now, I, I, I always have long kind of uh, known about Virginia's kind of crazy alcohol laws. But the more I talked to people, the more I realized this wasn't a one state problem, it was a 50 state problem. And it was something that we saw all over America. Every state had an antiquated system often derived from the same time period in our history, post-prohibition, which, which we can get into. Uh, and, and I just realized that there was um, a real need to talk more about the things that people were dealing with in the alcohol uh, policy or in the alcohol uh, sector and arena. Um, and also it affects consumers, you know, it affects uh, everyone on this call, people that uh, enjoy alcohol responsibly, that uh, may want to get uh, some kind of a special craft beverage that they like. And oftentimes it's harder than it should be. If they have a IPA they really love from Vermont, uh, it's really hard to get it uh, shipped to you uh, depending on where you live. Um, and so I, I just wanted to uh, write a book that kind of provided a systematic overview and lay of the land, kind of uh, hit home the point that this was a, a 50 state issue all across America, which is why I tried to highlight one law from each uh, state in the country and, and some extras. Um, and, and then also talk about the history and where it came from and maybe what we can do about it. And, and I think that um, it, was, it was a perfect topic uh, for uh, this 2020, uh, in, in retrospect, uh, era that we live in uh, because it's alcohol, so it's fun. So we, I was uh, uh, inspired to kind of uh, match a cocktail recipe for each law that I featured um, because when you're talking about alcohol, if you're not having fun, you're not doing it right, in, in my view. So I thought it was a perfect opportunity to uh, raise a little more awareness about it, but uh, have fun along, along the way as well. So that, that's why I decided that, that this area of our, of our legal system needed to be written about. 
Excellent, excellent. Well, and you also uh, salute you for having the decency for putting uh, this book in a fun, easily accessible format and not cranking out some dense legal treatise. Um, thank you. Um, you mentioned prohibition. A century ago, a lot of Western nations enacted it, uh, including our fine country. Today, we're seeing prohibition being imposed in nations in uh, Asia and Africa. Why does prohibition not work? Yeah, that's uh, it's very important and something that's overlooked often in the alcohol space. Um, you know, we've even seen uh, versions of it closer to home. I mean, during uh, COVID-19, Mexico uh, stopped its, its production, uh, ordered it stopped. Um, it, it, it doesn't work because any time throughout human history, and you know this as well as I, having written a, a book on, on moonshine specifically and illicit spirits and where that came from, anytime we raise the barriers uh, for access to alcohol, human beings have still desired that product and still find a, found a way to produce it or get it. And that has resulted uh, almost every time that happens in a black market springing up. It's what happens during America's prohibition experiment uh, back in the 20s and 30s. And it's still what happens today. You know, you still read, if you follow uh, newsletters in the drinks industry, you still read very often uh, news reports coming in from rural villages in, in Asia and India, as you referenced, uh, where a whole village uh, is sick from alcohol poisoning and, and a good portion of them uh, perish from it. And it's because oftentimes it's really hard for them to get access to uh, licit or legal alcohol. So therefore they have people who are making illicit, illegal alcohol. And oftentimes, unsurprisingly, they're not as good at it or they're taking uh, shortcuts to try to make it as cheap as possible. Uh, they are doing it in unsanitary conditions. And the result being is that they create an inferior product that uh, can, can be dangerous for people. So ultimately it is, it is a public health and safety issue. We've uh, seen it, as I said, close to home in Mexico, but, but in a, a smaller version of it, even a little bit, uh, in, in Pennsylvania during, during COVID, they, uh, when all the states were going about issuing their emergency orders, they decided that uh, some uh, uh, businesses were essential, quote unquote, and others were non-essential. Initially, they said liquor stores were non-essential. It's a control state. The only place to go get them is from the government run retail stores there. So they shut them all down. And it immediately, of course, again, led people are going to find a way for booze to get booze immediately led to people flooding over state lines, to New Jersey, to West Virginia, uh, to Pennsylvania, just flooding uh, or to Ohio rather, just flooding those states liquor stores on the border and it overwhelmed those stores. They couldn't social distance right. Some of them even had to close down. They were just temporarily because they were so overwhelmed by the crush of people. Uh, and it probably uh, on the margins made the spread of the virus worse because we're in, in a, have a government policy that's encouraging people to all get together instead of uh, stay socially distant. So again, uh, the take home uh, message being that every time we try to uh, make it more complicated to get alcohol for people, we encourage riskier routes to get that alcohol, whether it's making it uh, uh, oneself or having the neighborhood person making it or going to a greater distance to obtain it. So uh, that, that, that's why uh, prohibition doesn't work. And a better uh, kind of process for lawmakers and policymakers is to find a way to create safe legal access to it um, and, and, and make sure that you know, yes, we need some rules around alcohol, but make sure they're ones that uh, are, are, are protecting public health and safety and then also kind of uh, ensuring that, that they're not so high that people are doing really risky behavior to get alcohol. Yeah, quite right. Um, you know, people have been <coughs> consuming fermented uh, distilled beverages for millennia. Uh, and it's a global phenomenon. And to simply imagine that one can, you know, wag one's finger and make it stop is uh, fanciful. Uh, in this country, um, a lot of us are familiar with the bad things that happened with prohibition. Um, you know, there was the rise of the various brutal criminal gangs. There was the, as you mentioned, the toxic liquor that was being peddling out there. There was also a huge plunge in tax revenue because the legal distilleries had been largely shut down and all the booze that was being made was being made by people who didn't pay taxes. Uh, but one thing you note in your book, um, which was really quite interesting, is that prohibition in this country had a negative effect on apple growing in America, which is not something I think a lot of people know about. Can you tell us about, a bit about that? 
Yeah, that, that's a fun one. Um, it, uh, it's interesting. Prohibition did a lot of things, as you mentioned, and you could have a whole uh, event just on, on Prohibition, many of them, and many people have. Uh, one of the things it did is really uh, hurt kind of drinks culture uh, in America. Uh, there, there was a real tradition, it was called the golden age of cocktails, where uh, bartenders were making really nice drinks for people using fresh ingredients, fresh juices. Uh, you know, a better alcohol than, uh, and oftentimes, and in, in, in many cases, than, than would come after Prohibition. And when, when Prohibition happened, the bartenders didn't have anywhere to work, and neither did the producers. And so they all uh, uh, either went into other industries or left. A lot of bartenders went overseas, a lot of America's most famous and best bartenders at that time. Um, and, and so that uh, inspired me to kind of look at what else uh, in uh, kind of unintended consequence-wise uh, Prohibition did in our country. And one of the things that I discovered is that it, it really uh, affected the, uh, the apple uh, crop uh, in America. And, and that sounds bizarre at first blush, but if you think about it, when, when a, a colonial Americans and early Americans in the lead up to prohibition were growing orchards, it was not just to have a lot of apples. They weren't just big apple enthusiasts. They had orchards because they realized that they could produce uh, cider if the juice from the apples was fermented. And so they grew orchards, uh, particularly in rural locations. Cider was, uh, for a time, the most popular beverage in America, actually. Uh, John Adams most famously would drink it for breakfast every morning, but that was, that was par for the course. I mean, every American was drinking uh, gills of cider uh, very frequently, hard cider. And so we had this wonderful uh, uh, kind of heritage and culture of, of these apple orchards everywhere. And they were just, because they were so widespread, there was this great variety of different kinds of apples that everyone uh, was enjoying to make cider. Uh, prohibition happens and the uh, feds are trying to increasingly get aggressive in their crackdowns. They start oftentimes in the cities um, and some of the big uh, famous law enforcement busts that, that we read about even today where there was news articles written about, but they realized that a lot of the source of of, uh, of illicit booze was coming from the country, uh, from very rural areas, from Appalachia, from uh, people that were farmers that were headed still on their farm or were producing maybe hard cider from their orchards. And so they sent agents out across America into the field, and it sounds so ridiculous today, but they literally sent agents out with axes and just chopped down hundreds of thousands of acres of apple orchards uh, on people's private property just because they didn't want them to have access to be able to produce hard cider. Um, and that just absolutely decimated uh, America's uh, apple crop, but also its culture. Uh, and so it's a big reason why until very recently, we haven't seen a huge variety of apples in America. We see, you know, the Red Delicious, we, you know, start seeing Honeycrisp, some new different kinds of brands. Uh, but these really weird old brands and this variety of apples. We, America used to have the most variety and species of apples of any country uh, in the world. That all went away because of that. And it's just a real example of the cost and unintended consequences that a policy like prohibition can bring, not only for the drinks themselves, but also the source ingredients for those drinks. And I, I thought it was important to highlight because it, it shows anytime policymakers do a drastic thing like prohibition, they're creating ripple effects across a whole country and an economy. So that was, that was just one example of how that played out. Yeah, yeah. Dangers of heavy-handed centralized action, tearing up the social fabric and creating all sorts of un, unforeseen consequences. Yeah. Now, <clears throat> prohibition was repealed nearly a century ago, but as your book details, its spirit lives on in many public policies. Uh, and as I read through your book, I was reminded of how almost Soviet some of these policies are. Um, it, the book references a, a law in a town in Alaska that actually you know, put the hair on the back of my neck up because uh, it just seemed flat out creepy. What was that about? Yeah, in uh, it's Bethel, Alaska, which is a, a small uh, town up there. They've actually uh, tried to um, control like the amount of uh, of alcohol that their residents can uh, possess at any one time, and they actually have a, a <laughs> theoretically. I don't know, you know, how much they're updating it, but they theoretically actually have a, a database that's ran by the government that that tracks that, and it really goes into detail. There's only a certain amount of gallons of beer you can have, and of distilled spirits, and and of wine. Um, and and it, it, it was, it's an interesting one because it A, shows the power of local governments. Oftentimes in the alcohol space, you focus on the state governments. 
uh, especially uh, post-prohibition when the federal government stopped uh, regulating alcohol as much as, as it used to. Uh, but it shows the local governments are still really powerful and often have a very prohibitionary mindset uh, when it comes to alcohol. Um, and, and that's, you know, you see it with dry counties uh, where you can't have uh, any alcohol uh, purchased or transported into those counties uh, legally. And you see it uh, in situations like Bethel where they're still actually trying to control the amount of, uh, of alcohol that people uh, have uh, in their possession, which is insane. I think if you think about it in 21st century America, I think if you most told most Americans about that, they would be shocked, frankly, uh, that, that it sounded so Soviet era, uh, as you said. Yeah, yeah, the thought of, you know, an inspector coming to my door and, you know, wanting to see, uh, you know, what's in my basement or in my garage with a clipboard and taking a little inventory of all of it is really, really kind of creepy. Um, uh, creepiness uh, aside and the paternalism aside in some of the drinks laws, your book demonstrates that a lot of booze laws are just either explicitly cronyist or just kind of silly. Mm -hmm. um, tell the audience about one cronyist law and, and and one particularly silly law. Already. Yeah, uh, uh, that's a good uh, a good point. Really, it, it oftentimes does boil down to uh, some kind of a, a cronyist uh, type issue. Um, you you uh, one of the best examples of that um, is uh, in, in Indiana, uh, where they um, have uh, their uh, infamous uh, warm beer law, uh, where they actually prevent. Uh, uh, gas stations and grocery stores there from uh, selling uh, alcohol or uh, excuse me from selling cold beer uh, in those stores they can sell beer but they can't uh, put it in a refrigerator or put it on ice to give it to you cold uh, liquor stores can do that there's less of them they have a separate license um, and and you know the, of course the convenience stores and gas stations want to be able to do this and they've tried to uh, changed the law over time. They finally got the ability to sell chilled wine. So, you know, white wine they can put in a cooler, but the beer still has to be warm there. And, and really large part uh, from the people I've talked to there, it hasn't changed because the liquor store licensees want to kind of keep that ability to be the only game in town when it comes to cold beer. Um, and it's just, again, one example out of many in the alcohol space where they're the way our system has been designed has created a tremendous amount of reliance interests over time. And it's hard even to blame uh, the, the people that, that have those reliance interests because their business is developed and oftentimes around uh, the way that our uh, system has been designed. And so they then therefore do not want to give up the ability that they may uniquely have or the role they uniquely play um, in the alcohol system. It's oftentimes a government created artificial role that they play uh, that might not necessarily be the case if it was more unregulated. Uh, but, but unsurprisingly, they want to be able to keep uh, that uh, intact. And so they have a huge amount of reliance interests uh, when, when it comes to their, their underlying uh, business model. Um, and, and, and kind of as far as a, a bigger picture, um, uh, law that might have more of a, a kind of widespread effect, as you said, um, that uh, isn't just cronious, but also has a harmful effect is, is I think, control states generally. Um, that There's a lot of different laws that come from control states, but for those that are familiar, control states uh, basically are states where the government controls either the wholesale or retail level of spirit sales or both in some cases. Uh, there's over a dozen states that have some version of a, of a control system. Uh, and, and that's uh, really uh, uh, a very uh, interesting model, a kind of an outdated model, of course, uh, un unlike a lot of uh, really any other industry uh, where the government's acting as a private uh, retailer or market participant in it. Um, and it has a lot of harmful effects. Uh, it, um, it, you know, everything from distilleries themselves when they want to sell their bottles on premise, they have to technically become a government agent store to be able to sell uh, those bottles uh, to consumers. Uh, they have to jump through a whole ton of hoops to get their products accepted by the uh, state-run retail stores uh, in those states. Sometimes the states are very receptive to it. Uh, in other states, they're not. It's a uh, government committee that's deciding which alcohol is carried uh, in that store or not. And, and if they don't get accepted, then they're effectively locked out of that state, um, even their backyard, if it's their own state. So I think that that's a, a good example of kind of the stakes that are at play, uh, which can be a, a huge stakes for a business. It can really be the difference between them uh, being able to grow, uh, being able to have more employees on board, or maybe even being able to survive. Um, 
and uh, and not being able to if, if they get shut out of uh, out of markets or have too many hoops to to jump through. So uh, I think those are kind of two examples: one of a cronyous and one of just an overall uh, harmful one. That um, you know, what two of many uh, is, is I guess the theme of this is. Uh, but, you know, every every state has their versions of this that fall under one or both categories. Yeah, yeah, and some of the, the silly ones are seem to. Uh, the silly laws often involve like labeling, like you know, what images you can put on a bottle of beer or not. Right. Um, yeah, you see that uh, <laughs> in the um, at, well, in all alcohol spaces, we we've, we've seen it quite a bit in the, in the beer space. There's been uh, several high-profile lawsuits uh, against um, the, both the TTB has to uh, sign off on, on alcohol labels, but then also states uh, do in, in many cases. Um, some states deem the TTB sign off sufficient for their labeling purposes. Others have additional requirements. Um, there's been some lawsuits where uh, brewers uh, mostly have, have sued um, and said that, you know, their First Amendment rights are, are being violated if they can't call their beer what they want to call it or if they can't uh, you know, uh, have some backstory about the beer because it's, it's considered uh, uh, you know, inappropriate or something in some way. So yeah, that, that's a, a great example of a, of a silly one that, uh, that you see a, a quite surprising amount because you know, many, many alcohol producers are trying to be very clever with their marketing and try to have tongue in cheek uh, names for their, for their spirit product, uh, products. And so they inevitably run into these laws that uh, ban uh, different types of things that you can say on a label. Yeah, yeah, I remember once encountering a rule against, um, you know, beer labels having uh, Santa Claus on them because that might be considered marketing to children. It was just so convoluted and silly. Um, well, let's, let's move on to a more cheerful subject, having gone through a bit of the grimness and insanity of some of our drinks laws. Where did you get all these cocktail recipes? Yeah. yeah, that was the fun part, I think, uh, for, for, you know, uh, someone like us uh, that, that is into to drinks uh, uh, world. Um, it, 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 was, it was fun. I, part of them were, were um, kind of riffs on uh, very traditional, uh, famous, uh, uh, you know, um, cocktails out there, like the old fashioned, right? I mean, every cocktail book almost, or many of them have an old fashioned recipe, so it was easy to do a spin or riff off that. Um, and, you know, Negroni and other stuff like that. Uh, part of them were just ones that I kind of came up with over time, um, just kind of playing uh, at home uh, mixologist, mixing things together. Uh, some of them were ideas I got from other bartenders or mixologists that I've met over the years working in this space. Uh, family members sometimes, some of the family members are often overlooked, but they're uh, oftentimes very good uh, amateur mixologists themselves. So tweaking and updating some of those things. Um, and I tried to, uh, best I could, uh, uh, kind of make them inspired by some of the laws that we talked about. So in Washington State, for example, uh, they um, uh, limit the amount of, uh, of products that you can taste if you go to a distillery uh, in Washington State to below two ounces, or two ounces is the max, you can't go over that. So you can go to the breweries there and drink as much beer as you want, but the distilleries there, they're limited to this two ounces that they can you know, have you, you taste and, and try and drink on premise. And so for that one, for example, I, uh, I created a cocktail with, uh, you know, 1.999 repeating ounces uh, 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 whiskey in it, uh, you know, obviously to uh, somewhat make fun of, uh, of that law. So um, it, it, it was fun, you know, when you, whenever you can kind of play around with different ingredients and figure out what tastes good and then find a way to uh, maybe tie it to uh, some kind of a law you're talking about, it's, it's a lot of fun. But yeah, it was just, it was over time. It was not something that happened overnight. It was just... Uh, collecting and thinking about drinks recipes for a long time, having, having been in the space. Yeah, well, you know, the, re the demands of being a researcher in the booze world are, are severe. I, I feel sorry for all the experimentation you must have had to do to perfect these recipes. <laughs> yeah, the field research is really the toughest part, man. <laughs> so if, if you had to choose all 65 cocktail recipes, which three would be your tops? Oh man, three's three's tough. Uh, uh, the one that I pick out is the is the very favorite um, is uh, a ginger caipirinha. My uh, my wife's family is uh, Brazilian. Uh, they introduced me to the caipirinha as the uh, Brazilian uh, you know the national drink of Brazil. Uh, usually made with cachaça. Sometimes you see vodka subbed in for people that don't like cachaça as well. 
but uh, it's a wonderful drink. It's, you know, lime, sugar, uh, and cachaça. Uh, and, and I had fun with that one. I added a, a little bit of ginger liqueur to it and a dash of uh, ginger beer. Um, and, and I always loved that one because it was, uh, it's kind of a, uh, important to me because of uh, my wife's heritage, but then also a fun uh, way to update it. They're particularly good for fall because the Caipirinha is a summer drink, but the ginger notes give it a little bit more of a fall winter uh, holiday flavor. So uh, that, that's probably uh, my favorite um, one uh, overall. Um, I, uh, I like the uh, uh, spin I have on, on the old fashioned. Um, it's not, uh, um, you know, anything that will surprise someone that's a huge drink uh, aficionado, but I love to, uh, uh, do a couple different bitters uh, in the old fashioned uh, orange bitters and then, uh, you know, traditional kind of Angostura type bitters. And I think that adds a nice little fun flavor to it. So that might be a, another one that, uh, that I highlight. Um, and also I'm, uh, uh, uh very, uh, uh, into the, uh, eggnog recipe that actually made its way in there, um, about the law actually that involved uh, Santa Claus, uh, from, I think it was Ohio in that case. Um, the uh, eggnog recipe is a fun kind of traditional eggnog, a very stiff textured eggnog uh, that's really hearty um, and uh, but simple. Um, it just relies on uh, you know hand beating the eggs um, and putting the cream in and the bourbon and, and the sugar. So uh, those are just three examples of, of ones that I really like. But again, I tried to uh, keep things focused on, on the ingredients and, and not get too, too fancy, make it accessible for people. So it's not something really obscure that they don't have access to. So. Right, right. Um, your book spends a lot of time talking about a lot of bad laws and regulations in this country. But just stepping back, are drink laws in America getting better or worse? Yeah, well, it's funny. If we would have had this um, uh, whole uh, uh, you know, talk maybe in January, say, um, or last November, uh, I would have said that it, it's uh, a frustrating status quo. Things are, are somewhat getting better in some places, but it is slow moving and slow going. Uh, and that, that's still generally accurate, but uh, COVID has uh, totally upended things, um, definitely temporarily, and it seems like uh, somewhat at least long-term. Um, and, and it is caused because so many businesses that serve alcohol are businesses kind of designed around people gathering in person, bars, restaurants, uh, local brewery, local distillery, local winery. They want people to come there and all of a sudden they couldn't do those things, of course, when a lot of the emergency orders and social distancing orders were coming out uh, in the uh, early part of COVID. Uh, they're also oftentimes very small businesses. There's obviously big people that produce alcohol, the, the big companies, but there's a lot of uh, craft ones and smaller ones. And I think lawmakers were forced to reckon with the fact that those businesses probably would die if they didn't have some access to get their products to market. And so they were forced to finally rethink some of these things that we take for granted in other industries. You know, food delivery has been around for since you could deliver in America, right? Alcohol has always been different. Um, there's some reasons for that, but most of them are uh, addressable uh, in given modern technology and, and how our economy has developed. And so people start asking questions like, why can't I get um, alcohol or a, a, a cocktail um, along with my takeout nachos from the local uh, restaurant down the street or with uh, the pizza that I get usually? And, and why can't we get delivery alcohol, maybe uh, alcohol shipped from another state? They started asking these, the lawmakers themselves started asking these questions and the consumers were asking these questions. And it has led to uh, a lot of states adopting to go delivery alcohol uh, uh, reforms. A lot of them are temporary, obviously, while COVID uh, exists, but several states now have started doing the work of actually making them permanent, realizing why weren't we doing this in the first place? Maybe this is a good idea. Uh, you know, we need to have some rules around how we do it, but, you know, this is something that is weirdly uh, archaic and out of date in our modern economy, and maybe now is the time to rethink that in light of having a global pandemic where people are socially distancing and staying at home and, and self-quarantine. So I think there's some reason for optimism uh, with it, uh, probably more than there was uh, even a year ago. I think long term, we're, we're headed towards a, a forced <laughs> liberalization of these markets because that's how things always work. 
uh, technology forces regulation to keep up and modern, modernity forces uh, uh, government to keep up, but usually very slowly and things are moving quicker now, I think, because of, of COVID and the key will be how many of these things can be made permanent. So. Um, I have one more question and then we'll turn to the audience questions. And uh, I should uh, note here that if you're out there and you want to get a question into the queue, we've got a bunch, uh, please pop them into the question and answer box. And so let's go to my last question, which is um, most drinks laws and regulations are local. Um, is there anything Congress has been doing or should be doing to improve drinks law in the country? Yeah, uh, you're right. So many people focus at the, the sub-national level uh, after prohibition with alcohol, which, which makes some sense. Uh, but the, the federal government still is involved in things like uh, oftentimes labeling issues, uh, tax uh, issues. Uh, I think, you know, most importantly, what will be on Congress's uh, agenda in the short term with, with the alcohol space is the uh, extension of the craft uh, beverage Modernization uh, and Tax Reform Act as part of the uh, big tax reform uh, package from uh, this administration and Congress several years ago. It was only uh, for two years. It wasn't made permanent. Uh, it reduced uh, alcohol taxes on uh, craft uh, producers uh, across all, you know, beer, wine, and and spirits. Um, and it was really the the first kind of uh, updating of the tax code that a lot of those uh, producers had had uh, since you know, decades. Uh, in the case of, of distilleries, it was the first time the tax code had been changed materially, even since almost like the Civil War or something like that. So it was, it was a, a very uh, long overdue reform of, of the tax uh, code um, to reduce the rates that, that some of those, especially the small producers, uh, face because, again, they usually, uh, it's the toughest on them. Right, uh, and so that uh, was uh, extended by one year last year, and now it's up for renewal again. Um, and especially in the middle of COVID, uh, that's something that Congress really needs to think about and move on because uh, hitting uh, the alcohol uh, industry with a tax increase right now in the midst of some of the tariff difficulties and, and machinations that have been going on with this administration and amidst the uh, uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic, which has uh, just, you know, uh, uh, really hurt their bottom lines, obviously, uh, during this time, they've had to lay off people and, and condense. Hitting them with a tax increase would be, would be really bad. <laughs> It'd be a bad, an example of bad policy because it would lead to a lot more uh, uh, jobs, um, people losing jobs. Another thing that the federal government has done just briefly is they uh, uh, issued their updated dietary guidelines, which actually recommended um, uh, a reduction in the amount of uh, recommended alcohol for the average male um, and, and they're still in the process of, of uh, figuring out where that's going to go um, uh, uh, internally at the FDA and uh, HHS. But it, it's something that um, is worth looking at for people on uh, Capitol Hill. It was kind of interesting the way they did it. Uh, there's some uh, kind of sketchiness with uh, their rationale and some of the scientific basis behind that that I think is uh, something that would be, uh, you know, worth Congress uh, taking a look at um, because, uh, uh, it was really a, a little bit, a little bit tenuous their justification for for doing that. So th those are just uh, two small things, but uh, but yeah, I think that that making sure that you know nothing's done right now to hurt uh, the the alcohol space is really important um, given given the current situation we're in. Yeah, yeah. Um, when I've gone out and, and visited distilleries, one of the things that's been greatly impressed upon me is that um, uh, distilling or brewing and venting is, uh, is a form of manufacturing. It's agricultural based manufacturing, but you know, it, you need glass, you need wood, you need machines, you need all sorts of stuff. Um, and it's often backbreaking and uh, physically intense. Um, and uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of political anxiety around the kind of you know, hollowing out of manufacturing in this country and, and that sort of thing. Uh, but drinks and the kind of explosion in the number of distilleries and breweries that, that we've had, which followed on a wave of a explosion in the number of wineries, um, that's a bright spot um, economically. Yeah, yeah, was, I think it was 2017, uh, the um, uh, uh, alcohol industry, wine, beer, and, and uh, spirits industry 
uh, writ large produced, I think, the second most gains in manufacturing jobs of, uh, of any industry. Um, that's wild. I mean, you know, these politicians, as you said, love donning the hard hats and going to the factory floor and showing how much they care about blue collar manufacturing jobs. And the best way to do that is to, uh, to help the alcohol space right now. It's one of the big growth industries, one of the few growth industries in, in the blue collar manufacturing sector right now in America. So yeah, it, it's a further reason kind of for, uh, for lawmakers at all levels really to, to pay attention to it, I think. All right, turning now to audience questions. Again, please feel free to pop some more in there. Uh, we have a question here uh, about the three-tier system. And the uh, person asking it suggested that the three-tier system does like to defend its turf. Um, and then ask the question about why not further liberalized direct shipping? Yeah. That way we kind of cut out the middleman. We have a system that's more, you know, structured structured more efficiently around warehouses and high technology and transportation delivery companies yeah. to bring people what they want. Have you looked into that or thought much about that? Or is that yeah. is that happening out there thanks to the internet? And yeah. Yeah, well, no, that's the, uh, it's really the million dollar question going forward is, is what the direct right. consumer shipping market uh, looks like uh, in, in, you know, a couple of years from now. Uh, wine, of course, um, is most states allow wineries to ship to consumers. Uh, the uh, uh, wineries starting out in California, um, you know, in the 70s and 80s became very popular. People would go visit them. They would go home. They would want that wine shipped to them. Um, and the wineries were successful in getting laws in place that would allow that. Uh, beer and spirits uh, are uh, not as liberalized as that. It is much more difficult, uh, particularly across state lines, to have direct consumer shipping uh, of beer and spirits uh, from a, say, producer in one state to a consumer in another state. It raises constitutional questions that uh, has resulted in some Supreme Court decisions, actually, um, and uh, it, it also raises uh, a lot of uh, jurisdictional issues when you're going from one one state to uh, another. Also, oftentimes retailers, um, we talked about producers, but now retailers, they have trouble shipping across state lines. In many states, they're not allowed to do so. So uh, getting to a point where we have more of an interstate uh, market uh, is, uh, you know, is, 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 is not necessarily straightforward because there's a lot of uh, legal barriers that would need to be navigated. But again, uh, because of uh, the pandemic we're in, people are starting to ask the question more. And during the pandemic, Kentucky actually passed um, a, a relatively uh, forward-thinking law that allowed direct consumer shipment for uh, all types of alcohol. So it included spirits and included beer. Uh, you can ship it uh, from other states if those states have a reciprocal agreement uh, with Kentucky. Again, not a huge list right now, but uh, they put the framework in place. Um, and and that, that was a, a bill that was kind of going through the machinations pre-COVID and we're winding its way through the legislature there. But uh, I think COVID helped push it over uh, the, the finish line. And there was lawmakers that talked about the heightened importance of something like that uh, in, in Kentucky uh, because of, of the pandemic. And so it, it, it really is a, a great question. I think it's something that is coming. Again, the technology is obviously there. You know, we know how to ship uh, goods interstate. We do it all the time with everything. Uh, so the question will be updating the state laws to get to a point where that will be possible, uh, given our kind of patchwork 50 state system for alcohol regulation. One of our audience members uh, asked about the corona uh, deregulatory movement that happened mm -hmm. and wonders, you know, are these uh, kind of liberalizations in laws and regulations, are they likely to stick? Or do you imagine that they're going to become reimposed, you know, once we get through this strange period of time? Yeah, I alluded to this a little bit earlier. I mean, right now, um, the vast majority of the stuff you've seen is temporary, but there's been, you know, Iowa passed uh, the uh, first to go cocktail bill uh, permanent that made it permanent this year. Uh, Michigan uh, passed one that will extend it for uh, five years. Um, and, you know, again, if you're doing it for five years, you're getting pretty close to uh, permanency for it. Uh, New York's considered a bill to extend it by uh, two years. So Ohio just passed a to-go cocktail bill uh, to make it permanent. Georgia passed a delivery law uh, for retailers to deliver uh, alcohol to consumers' doors. Um, 
uh, in an on-demand uh, capacity. So uh, we, we are starting to already see that some of it will be permanent and the key will be how much of it. Uh, obviously, uh, it's something that's been foremost on my mind uh, because I think that it's so rare do you have, an, uh, uh, for the policy nerds out there, an Overton window shift like this where all of a sudden uh, things that uh, were not being talked about yesterday are being talked about and, and politically viable. Um, and so uh, it, it, it's uh, very important to kind of seize on that momentum and, uh, and get a lot of it locked into place um, while, we, while, while there's this opportunity out there. So I, I think that, um, you know, yes, most are temporary now, but we're already seeing signs and down payments on many of them becoming permanent and the, the devil will be in the details as to how many ultimately get there. Right, right. Yeah, um, I, I recall that after the Great Recession, 2008, we saw a number of states decide to, to liberalize their drinks laws. And it wasn't for any sort of high-minded moral reason or ideas about fairness and competition. It was, they wanted more tax revenue. And so they started saying things like, okay, yeah, you, you run a brewery, you can also have a tasting room, or you have a distillery, you can you know, put in a bar and, and sell cocktails there. We're gonna create some sort of process that you can go through so that you can have that. Yep. And uh, you know, it was in large part aiming to raise money by encouraging drinks tourism. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it used to be the case that breweries and wineries and distilleries were kind of not particularly attractive places. They weren't designed to host guests. And California sort of pioneered in that and really developed this kind of like go to California and visit the wineries thing. And then belatedly breweries and distilleries got into it. Mm -hmm. And then when the great recession came, you know, okay, let's, you know, try to find revenue for the states. And uh, that was one place they turned. So uh, one wonders if the past is prologue and maybe these uh, loosening, loosening of laws will stick. Yeah, and that, that, that's, I think, uh, a great hope here is that, uh, I mean, states are already having revenue crunches right now, um, and it's just going to get worse. And so this might be one way to help uh, with that. There's non-revenue uh, reasons and non-tax reasons to reform this stuff, obviously, too, as we've talked about today. But uh, that oftentimes can be an extra incentive for, uh, for policymakers to pay attention. Mm -hmm. Yeah, especially many states do have the balanced budget amendments, and so they're always clawing around trying to find revenue. And if the typical streams have atrophied, well, turn to turn to drinks. I mean, yep. some of the earliest drinks policies in this country were taxes. Yep, exactly. Um, politicians are always looking for money. Um, we have another question here. It says, uh, you, Jarrett, mentioned in one of your answers that in control states, an alcohol producer can be shut out of his own backyard. Is there any credible rationale for excluding a value-added product that is made in the state from these stores? Or is it most likely an external effect at play? Yeah, well, I, uh, that reference I made was having talked to several uh, distillers in Virginia over the years that um, have pitched several products to the Virginia ABC and had all of them uh, rejected. Um, I think it's important to keep in mind, you know, you always, uh, as a producer of any product, uh, have to persuade people to carry that product. I mean, I, same thing happened with my book, right? I mean, I, I, every bookstore, I can't just force them to carry my product, right? I, I, I hope that they like it. Um, maybe if I find one's interesting, I can tell them about it, hope they carry it. The thing that's different about control states is that, you know, if you, if, if I get rejected from one local bookstore to carry my book, I can go to the, the others in town, right, and try to persuade them to do it. Um, but with control states, uh, they, when the government controls all the retail locations within the state, it can effectively lock you out of getting into those retail level stores. So uh, in a place like Virginia, you would be restricted to just selling uh, on premise. Um, which is a much smaller market, obviously, than being able to get into uh, retailers from uh, across across the state. So, uh, you know, I don't think there is a, uh, uh, a great rationale for the Virginia ABC system. I mean, obviously, they can't carry every single spirit from every single distiller, uh, but um, a lot of them don't want that. They just want one or two, or at least to not just get entirely locked out of, out of the market. So, um, you know, no, there, there is no rationale for locking a, a local business entirely out of its own backyard marketplace at all, I don't think. Um, it, it's understandable why it happens under the current system. That doesn't mean it's a, a good thing. Another audience member asked, if there was one alcohol law that you could wave your magic wand and get rid of, what would it be? 
Yeah, I uh, I hate to keep harping on on control states. I mean, Pennsyl Pennsylvania, uh, Virginia. Um, there's many others out there in North Carolina um, uh, that, that uh, deal with the controlled state system. I just think that it's it's not. I pick it because it's not just a law, but it leads to many silly laws in those states, um, and it leads to things like Pennsylvania shutting down all of its liquor stores uh, during uh, COVID. Um, and, and it's just, uh, it, 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 it's such an all encompassing uh, uh, structure that's so antiquated um, that it has, I think, the biggest effect of, of any of the laws that, that we talk about in my book or, or even tonight. Um, so that, that would be the natural one to pick. I mean, again, it's so odd in 21st century America to have government be a market participant uh, in an uh, industry that sells private goods. It's very hard to think of, of other parallels. You know, maybe the National Park Service runs like a, uh, you know, a, or the state park system runs a gift shop, like a park or something like that, selling some private goods. But it's hard to find a lot of parallels for that. And that really begs the question of why are we doing that with alcohol and should it be changed? And I would say, yes, that'd be the one I would pick. You mentioned the craft beverage modernization. Um tax reform. What efforts could people undertake in order to uh, get that re-upped? That's what one audience member would like to know. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's an old-fashioned answer, but uh, it, it still matters. It's getting in touch with uh, your representatives. Um, that It's a bipartisan thing. I mean, they, the co-sponsors that um, have uh, lined up in both the Senate and the House is comprehensive. It's a huge amount. Uh, it's a majority, uh, and it's uh, a big majority, and it's very bipartisan. Um, and unfortunately, the way Congress works today, which uh, that's your area of expertise, um, unfortunately, it doesn't always mean that law gets passed. Um, there, at the end of the year, the way the cookie often crumbles, there will be a rush to do a bunch of tax extenders. Uh, and this has gotten, unfortunately, I wish it would have been made permanent, will unfortunately probably be lumped in with that. Um, and so it's just making sure it gets included. And the way to push for that is to, you know, be a bug in the ear of uh, your representatives and just, you know, tell them if you go to, um, you know, the uh, all the, the major um, uh, industry groups, uh, Distilled Spirits Council, um, and, and uh, you know, the Beer uh, Institute, and, and all the uh, wine institute, all of them have information on it and ways to get in touch with representatives. And I know it's an old fashioned answer, it's a grassroots answer, but that's the way to do it, uh, is to tell them that it's important and that you care about this and that the local uh, alcohol producers in your community are an important part of your community and they need this uh, tax relief to continue. So that, that's really the, the way to do it. It's a good old fashioned shoe leather democracy, I guess. One audience member would like to know, um, you know we're in the middle of a election and um, with two very different candidates running for president. Uh, has either of them said anything about alcohol policy or do you have any sense that one or the other would make any difference for drinks laws? Yeah, it's so hard to parse the stuff out. I mean, you know, obviously um, at the presidential debates, they're not asking uh, uh, President Trump or candidate Biden about uh, alcohol policy. It might make for a uh, more, more fruitful debate than the last one, perhaps, if they did talk about, about such things. But um, I think the one difference you could see might be on the trade landscape, um, but it's kind of TBD. We don't really know yet. I think there's a chance that um, that uh, President Biden will engage in at least uh, make it less of a priority, I should say, some of the trade war stuff that has really roiled the alcohol industry, raising aluminum prices, which affected uh, beer producers, obviously, and then the retaliatory tariffs uh, for, you know, the, the airline disputes that were spilling over into bourbon and, and other uh, spirits um, in, in Europe and America. So there may be less of an emphasis on that. One can always hope. I mean, I, again, I don't know if it's a real passion issue for a Biden administration, but uh, I don't think it could be worse, frankly, than it has been. Uh, so that, that might be one area where you see something different. Um, uh, again, it's really hard to know before uh, uh, a new administration on boards, but, but that would be the one obvious area, I think. Another message, another question that was messaged to me was um, the internet. It is famous for disintermediating businesses. How is it disintermediating the alcohol industry? 
Yeah, well, it just allows the interstate shipment uh, uh, system we mentioned to be possible technology-wise. It's still not always possible legal-wise, um, but it allows it to exist. And anytime something can exist and is frankly uh, pretty easy and streamlined, uh, it then forces uh, lawmakers to catch up eventually over time. Um, maybe that'll be accelerated with the pandemic as, as we discussed, but uh, that, that's why it changes things. It makes it uh, possible for a obscure distiller in uh, upstate uh, New York or maybe New Hampshire to market their product to someone like me in Richmond, Virginia. Maybe I will go visit there. Um, and then uh, theoretically, if it was legal, I could then get uh, their spirits shipped directly to me. So it allows this kind of hyper connectivity like it, like it does in every other industry uh, right now to exist. Um, so that, that's kind of the power of, of the internet. Um, and it could be a very disruptive force if unshackled in the alcohol space. All right. Let's go get into the speed round because we're in the last five minutes. Yeah. I got a question. The Supreme Court, is it looking at any drinks cases? They had the wine case not too long ago. Yeah, that's, uh, I, I, I can't do that justice with a quick answer, but uh, yes, is the short answer. Um, there's several cases that are now challenging the uh, uh, interstate alcohol shipment issue that I just mentioned. I actually just uh, posted about it uh, on uh, drinksreform.org uh, about some of the cases that are percolating. I'll, uh, I'll drop that link quickly here in the comments uh, for people um, uh, right now. But yeah, drinks, we have, a, we have a bunch of stuff on this on drinksreform.org and the short answer is yes, the Supreme Court uh, uh, has several cases it may consider to take. The question is whether they do it or not, uh, which is uncertain, but they're there. Okay. Uh, let's see what else. Ah, we also have a audience member and maybe our last one. Uh, who notes that uh, Bethel, Ala Bethel, Alaska, which you mentioned in your book, is in a remote Alaska native village with serious alcohol and bootlegging problems, and that they have these uh, very tough laws in place to try to minimize the abuse problem. Um, in looking at drinks laws, and you know, it is always an enduring problem with humans is that they sometimes want too much of a good thing, yeah. uh, and it leads to very bad things. Mm -hmm. um, have you seen um, states or localities that have come up with governance regimes or practices that are better than others? Yeah, uh, it, it, it's a good point. I mean, alcohol is a, a product that, that can take into excess, uh, uh, you know, be harmful. Um, it, obviously, there's negative externalities, potentially, like drunk driving. Um, there's uh, alcohol use disorders, uh, of course, as referenced. Um, I think that uh, we would do better as a society if we spent more time enforcing those that actually protect and have something to do with public health and safety versus some of these barriers that uh, that's the justification for them, but are they really helping that? Um, and, and I think that uh, that's a, a real open question. I mean, as far as ones that... Uh, uh, have a good structure for alcohol. If people ask me that a lot. It's very hard to pick because some are very good on some things and very bad on other things. Um, you know, uh, uh, Virginia, to pick on my home state, is uh, relatively decent uh, with beer, um, terrible with distilled spirits. Uh, you know, places like uh, Indiana and Indianapolis, you uh, can have a open uh, they have an open container law. You can responsibly uh, enjoy a beverage there. I think that might surprise people. Uh, uh, they think of New Orleans and they think of that, but you can in Indiana, but then they have the warm beer law that we talked about uh, earlier. Uh, you know, Michigan, you can uh, get uh, uh, everything from distilled spirits to wine at a gas station. Uh, you want license to sell all those things, but uh, Michigan has a, a whole host of uh, other uh, really bad things they do. So it's hard to pick one. Um, but I, I think that um, we're going to at least maybe get to a, a place where more of them are allowing uh, uh, shipment and delivery of alcohol, which is, which is progress and I think a, a good idea. Um, that, that if there's one kind of system I'd like to see more states adopt, it would be liberalizing, continuing to liberalize that. Yeah, and I would just throw in from my own observation that um, it's always been striking to me that um, there's a tendency amongst policymakers that if there is a... a drink problem to reach for the sort of punitive criminal justice type levers to pull to try to fix it 
uh, as opposed to kind of going down the treatment path. Yeah. Where, where are you going to put your dollars? Are you going to put them in cops doing inspections and et cetera, et cetera? Or are you going to put your money in like creating the medical treatment centers to get people right. the help that they need, whether it's mental health driven or, or whatever else? Exactly. We're down to one minute and we'll do one more question. Uh, oh, here's a good one. Do you think that the markup system in control states uh, actually constitutes illegal taxation? So what is the markup system and yeah. illegal taxation? What does this mean? Yeah, uh, this is a, an, another uh, great question that encourage people to head to drinksreform.org. We've written a lot about this uh, over the years, um, but just in a nutshell, one of the things control states can do is decide how much the markup is for the spirits that are sold in their state-run stores um, in the private marketplace that's set by what the market can bear. Uh, in control states, it's decided by whatever the government control state decides the markup should be. So it can be insanely high. Virginia's uh, is 69%, which is well in excess of what the private market can bear. Um, states like uh, Pennsylvania uh, give uh, basically no guidance to the uh, 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 Pennsylvania Liquor Control Board on what the, the markup is. And so effectively, when you have a markup like that that's well in excess of, of the private market, um, it's, it's just to generate revenue. That's why the states do it. They want high markups because then they get more money from their state controlled system. And so I've argued that it's de facto taxation. Uh, it's essentially raising revenue for the general fund, um, just with extra uh, hard, extra high um, uh, 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 markups. Um, and, and it's a, basically a stealth tax on residents that people don't even know about. So it, it, it's one of the many wonderful features, uh, if that's not depressing enough, of control states. And it's one that I uh, talk about uh, in my book, actually. But yes, that's... Uh, some of the examples, some of the shenanigans that can be played with, uh, with the control state system. Yeah, Ta taxation without representation. Uh, well, Jared, we're just past seven o'clock. Uh, it's been a wonderful hour with you. Thank you very much. Uh, I greatly enjoyed your book, Liberty, Give Me a Drink. Yep, um, appreciate it. Do you have any closing words, sir? No, thank you so much for doing this, Kevin. Um, it's uh, been a real high level talk with you as I knew it would be. Um, again, I'd encourage people that are uh, interested in this uh, type of stuff to head to drinksreform.org. Uh, you can learn more about the book there. Uh, we'll, we'll make sure to get people copies who uh, attended today. Um, but, but yeah, this is an ongoing conversation. So uh, yeah, uh, drop me a line at uh, drinksreform.org. There's a way to get in touch with me if you have further questions. And uh, and yeah, here's, uh, here's to uh, the rest of 2020. May we all get through it, uh, probably with a, a drink or two along the way. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you. And again, cheers to you, sir. Cheers. Thanks much. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Have a good night.